Greetings friends and fellow freelancers, welcome back to another episode of Tabletop Mercenary, a show where I do my best to pull back the curtain and explain just what it is that's going on behind uh, the business of TTRPGs and how we can all do our best to make a living in this very complicated part of the publishing industry. This week I wanted to address something that's been on my mind a lot because it affects all of us, big and small, when it comes to designers, publishers, etc. And it is something I have come to call trend chasing. I'm probably not the only one who calls it this, obviously. But it can be a serious problem, particularly if you are a small designer and you're trying to do everything yourself and you're trying to do everything in-house. Now, this is not something that affects just tabletop RPGs, obviously. This is something that is a huge problem for the publishing industry in general, particularly because you have lots of people who are aiming for yesterday's market and they don't realize that's what they're doing. Uh, as a good example, for folks who have been reading lots of genre fiction for the past decade and change, you may remember when the steampunk genre came really big on the scene in the 2000s. I believe it was the 2000s. That sounds right. But uh, the novel Bone Shaker is really where it seems to start. And after that, you see this trend of lots of similar books getting greenlit and coming out from a lot of different publishers. Because that's what happens when one thing does well, everybody else sees it does well, and you all start getting in on the game. And you see this in books, you see it in films, you see it in lots of other things, particularly when a new genre is created. But the issue with that is that it's sometimes difficult to tell what has staying power, what's really going to remain popular with your audience, and what is just going to be a flash in the pan, or what was really unique and can't be replicated what was lightning in a bottle and a lot of the time we fall into the same problem uh, we end up trying to design things for games for settings for genres that we really cannot replicate and a lot of the time we end up committing to a project that by the time it's out targets moved on uh, it's probably a good way of thinking about it of if you want to hit that target audience if you really want to be effective you need to lead them. You need to be out ahead of where they're going. You don't need to be aiming at where they were because they're not there anymore. And if that's where you're shooting, you're never going to hit your target. Uh, we see this all over the RPG industry, and it is something of an issue when a lot of us will see there's a new game that's getting popular or there's a new genre that people are really paying attention to. And so we decide, hey, I want to make money. I want to be a professional. I can make stuff for this. And so then you commit to putting together a game or putting together a big, big old chonking adventure path, whether it's be, you know, something for Pathfinder, it be something for Dungeons and Dragons or whatever system it is. And then by the time you've finished it, you've gone through editorial, you've gone through layout and you've gotten it published. That trend has moved on. No one's really interested in playing that game or using that particular type of product anymore. And it can be very frustrating, particularly if you're putting a lot of time, a lot of energy and a lot of your currencies, whether it be social, capital, you know, etc., into it, you're really going to have an issue. And nothing is immune from this, unfortunately. This is uh, something I've been thinking about because for those who saw my last video, you saw my unboxing for my game, Army Men. And if you haven't heard the story, I wanted to tell it to you and show that really nothing is guaranteed in this industry. And so you need to hedge your bets as best you can because there is no such thing as a promised return on investment. Even if you run all the numbers, even if you use all the information you have available to you, there's no guarantee that the market when your product releases is the market you're going to want it to be. Now, for folks who haven't heard this story, uh, I've told it on a couple of other platforms, so apologies if you have heard it before. But many years ago, I believe it was five or six years going on this year, um, I was put on retainer by a friend of mine who had started their own gaming company. That was what they wanted to do. And so I was like, all right, uh, what do you want me to do? And I, originally I was writing blogs, and then they decided I, they wanted to release their own game. They wanted something of their own on the market for sale. And I got tapped to essentially be the head designer for this. They wanted me to take the project and just run with it. And so we, we sat and we talked, and they wanted something that would appeal to the wargaming crowd, you know, the miniatures and rulers crowd. And we hemmed and hawed over what system was going to really work best for that. Of uh, The original suggestion was Fate, and um, 
I pointed out that fate was probably not going to attract a crowd that was used to rolling tons of dice and having a whole lot of specific rules. So eventually, after going through a whole bunch of different systems and talking about things that were available in the market, we settled on Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. Now we would make modifications to it, we would alter things, we would make the game unique, but that was, when we really got down to it, the game that was going to be most popular, that everybody knew the best, and that we could take the rules and, and really work with them, especially with the, the OGL as it existed at the time. So I spent two years, uh, I was the only one designing things for the game at that time, and after that two-year time, I had basically designed all of it. I was about 80% of the way through the uh, adventure module at the end of the book to give people something to run when they get it, when they decided to shutter their doors and end the company. So I was very fortunate in that the fellow who ran things uh, gave me permission to take the mostly complete add-on game and take it to somebody else. So I did. I took it to Josh Heath and the fellows at High Level Games, and we started making modifications. We started turning it into a full standalone RPG that also used the D&D 5e rule set. But this way, you know, people didn't have to already own the books. They didn't have to interpret things. They could just buy this one and be done. They had everything they needed to run Army Men. And we made a lot of adjustments, and yeah, it took time. We got some other people involved, and we were ready to go to Kickstarter when Wizards decided to try to rescind the OGL, and that whole debacle happened last year. There is no way we could have predicted that. There is no possible way we could have predicted that the new suits brought up to Wizards would try to turn everything into a bunch of microtransactions and attempt to eliminate what had been a standing peace agreement in the gaming industry for going on 20 years at that point, probably more if I actually sat down and looked at the timeline. Not only that, there's no way we could have predicted that D&D 5e, the game that had the largest loyal player base, would all of a sudden be something that lots of people were leaving and they were playing anything other than that. Now we still got the Kickstarter funded, we still made the game, there were still a lot of people that were really interested, but of all the things we could have predicted when we sat down to, or especially when I sat down in the original incarnation, I never predicted that there would be people demanding this be run on a system other than D&D 5e because it had such a loyal base, and there were so many people who played that system and only that system, that standing that on its head was something you could not have predicted would happen to the market. And when you have something that had been seen as that reliable, where the numbers were that steady for that long, suddenly being reversed and stood on its head, it really points out that everything is volatile in the game market specifically, but in publishing in general, there is no guarantee that what is popular today is going to be popular tomorrow. There's also no guarantee that it won't be, as a lot of the time these things come in cycles, uh, whether it's vampire fiction, whether it's certain subgenres, whether it's Dungeons and Dragons, you know, going out of favor and coming back into favor, whether it's rules like games are popular now, but which ones are going to stay popular? You know, which ideas are going to stick with us and which ones are just going to be a flash in the pan or which ones are going to be a small trend that was really popular just due to a weird internet fad for those of you who are fans of Morkborg. There is no way to really guarantee that what you're working on now is going to be what the audience wants, even if it fits exactly what people say they want right now. And that's why it's important to ask yourself, what are your game's unique selling points? What does it have that will help it stand on its own, even if that genre, the game system, the whatever the trend is currently demanding, is no longer a thing? You know, whether it's, is this a monster you don't normally get to play? Is this a completely unique setting? Is this a rule set that comes with a bunch of additions you've made that are just really fun? Or is it just a wonky rule setting where you get to play a bunch of plastic toys that you'd find in the dollar store aisle? And that's, uh, that's something that will give your game staying power, will give things more than just being part of the trend. Uh, it's more than just gluing some gears on it to achieve the aesthetic, for those who remember when that was going on due to the, uh, the popularity of steampunk. But it is also important to remember that trends are a thing, if you want to see if it has staying power and if you want to get in on it, you can often make something small. You can get in on it and sort of dip your toe and see if it's as popular as you think it's going to be. 
And a lot of the time that can help you get into it and really swim to the center of it so that if things are going on, you're already a part of the ongoing change in the trend. You can see things as it's happening. You'll have up-to-date numbers. For example, say that a new rule system came out or a new genre was, had been really popular. And so you wanted to get in on this as a designer. You don't have to create a full RPG or a massive campaign that people can play through for this just to get in on it. Those are things that take years and years of effort. Even if you have entire design teams, even if you have lots of good ideas, they're going to take at the very least a year to two years just to get the basic product out. So design something small, whether you're making videos on your YouTube channel, whether you're doing playthroughs of a particular system, whether you're making uh, game master supplements, whether you're doing some fun little rules conversions, yeah, anything small that'll get your foot in the water and you can take the temperature. Because if it turns out that what you're making is popular or there are people who really like this new trend in gaming, you may become one of the voices they listen to and that will give you the audience and it'll help you build up people that are paying attention so that when you do decide to do something big, when you do decide to commit, you can kind of gauge whether or not you have the audience who is going to support it, whether you're hoping that they'll back your Kickstarter or that they'll uh, buy copies of it when it comes out, whatever it is you'll know that they're there rather than just rolling the dice and hoping for the best with your eyes closed. And that is really all I've got for this week, but there is something I wanted to talk to folks about before I signed off here. And that is that of all the questions you all have asked, and I do pay attention to the comments here, the most popular question I have gotten is about Kickstarter specifically, but a couple of questions about crowdfunding in general. And I am paying attention to that. However, I need to get a guest on for that episode. And I have talked to Josh Heath, the fellow who ran the Kickstarter for Army Men that was successful. So, and he has run several other successful Kickstarters before that. So if you have questions about Kickstarter, if you're wondering about crowdfunding for your game, for your projects, leave your questions in the comments below and I will add them to the list of things that I want to cover during that interview. And uh, I'll see you next time. But until then, this is your Tabletop Mercenary. Signing off. First and foremost, thank you for staying to the end of this episode of Tabletop Mercenary. If there's a question you have about being an RPG creator, please don't hesitate to put it in the comments below so I can address it in a future episode. If you want to help me keep the lights on and keep this show going, then please consider subscribing to the channel, liking the video, and giving it a share on your own social media pages to help boost the signal. Lastly, if you really enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving a tip by buying me a Kofi or becoming a Patreon patron at the links in the video description below. You'll find me on both sites under the name The Literary Mercenary. <laughs>